education more inductive? I would say I would say that the uh, that probably slightly, but I would still categorize them both as inductive yeah. overall. Because of the pieces right. that trying to put together. Put together, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so what are some pros and some cons of the two differences? Well, uh, that con that I had was to worry about them thinking that they're thinking right mm -hmm. and, and buying into a misconception. However, we were talking, and you know, one of the things that we were discussing when you're little, you, you realize that you learn by mistakes. You make mm -hmm. a mistake and you learn from it. Mm -hmm. Then you get to that young adult age and you start rebelling and they quit thinking of that as a rational way to learn. And then as a, an adult, you come back and go, you know, that's a pretty good way to learn. And so the that's not a necessarily a bad thing because right immediately you're going to redirect that thinking. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would do something like this as a homework. This definitely needs to be a talked about, you know, working together kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but like you were saying on the critical thinking, you have to be wrong to learn how to think critically. I mean, you got to make mistakes to get to the next. That's what critical thinking is. is right. Is doing that. So I think that that's while it is a little bit of a nagging. You know, I'm like, ah, what if they buy into that and then. But at the same time, I I think it could be. I think it has more pros okay. on that side than that little bit of. Momentum, momentary con. Let, let's talk about more cons. Is this very social? I mean, I've tried to make this a bit more social, but it inherently does this seem like it's very social? Oh, I can make it real social. Mm -hmm. Give them the cards and have them sit in a group at the table. Okay, so maybe with the selection one, the yeah. group's maybe deciding which selections to make. Mm -hmm. And I think it also varies de developmentally, like, you know, the kid's age, mm -hmm. um, because that could work in, like, lower grades, too. And I mean, even in small group, like, I would do this with, with a small group, then mm -hmm. maybe doing it whole group. But I could see if they're a little older, like, they can do the work in a group and, like, do the cards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you could do the first one mm -hmm. as a class. That's still social. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you had us all talking, and I don't think that that would be any different than a group of students that you've developed a bond with as a teacher anyway. Mm -hmm. You could get them having that conversation, and that okay. is social. And then you could do the second one really lends itself to groups mm -hmm. because you're more focused on you have to figure out what the deal is. Okay. But there'd have to be some way that they would have to know they were going right or wrong. Yes. So right. that would be the... the yeah, that would be the backfall to that one is there'd have to be some way without giving it away for them to self-check. Okay. But you could do like have them sort it and then you go swing by and say, no, that, let, let me show you one that's different mm -hmm. and give them some guidance that way. Um, and so here's kind of some background information about Bruner and the, the theories that he had about these. So first of all, basically in the book, he defines concept almost synonymously with category, okay? Now, he did have sort of three different con types of concepts that he discussed. One type is conjunct uh, conjunctive, which means like really like and. So, for example, uh, we talked about uh, quadrilaterals and we talked about convex quadrilateral, or we talked about what convexity was, and then we talked about how figures can be convex and quadrilaterals. So maybe that could be a separate concept that could be conveyed, and that would be a conjunctive concept. A disjunctive concept is the same idea, except instead of an and, it's an or. And when we say or, it could be one or the other or both. We typically mean an inclusive meaning of, of or. Finally, the last one is relational. And so a concept could only convey a relationship between other concepts. Um, now, any kind of concept has attributes associated with it. Some attributes are critical, some attributes are not critical or non-essential. And attributes can have a bunch of different values. The value of an attribute is very important, but there may be several different values that will be acceptable amongst a range or almost like a domain of values. Um, so here's what I mean. For example, this is an apple. Okay, This is certainly an apple. An apple has properties associated with it. It has attributes, as Bruner would say. Okay, what's one attribute about an apple? Red. Okay, it's red. Does it have to be red? No. no. What else could it be? Green. Green or yellow, yellow or somewhere Green. in between? Somewhere in between. Okay, have we ever seen like a purple apple? 
You know, they've got a plumable. Have you seen that new plum, an apple that tastes like, was it a plum or a grape? No, it's grape. a grape. It's a grape. They've got a new grapple. They've got a new but, apple, and it, um, you're going to have to change the purple. Okay, all right. It, well, I, cause I with a typical the apple. Today and I gotta go, I mean, you be because you, you even said it was a grapple, right? So that's yeah. a different concept <laughs> slightly. Maybe that's a conjunctive, conjunctive concept. <laughs> okay, all right. Type. Okay, but it's typically not something that we associate mm -hmm. with uh, an apple. So color is an attribute. It's a critical attribute. Mm -hmm. And there's a range of values that we can expect it to have. Green, yellow, red, not purple. Okay. Um, also, have you ever seen an apple that looked like a cube? <laughs> Actually, no. Yes. Uh, really? okay. Over in Japan, they started growing them. They stick them in a box and they grow them square so they put them exactly in the box so they fill the whole thing up. Wow, that's very interesting. They've also started doing the same thing with uh, watermelons, cantaloupes, and honeydew melons. Okay. Well, but that's not that's not Very typical, smart. right? It's yeah, a little bit no, different. This isn't a, okay. That's an aggressive space. Right? Okay. All right. So, so the point is, is it's it's definitely an attribute. Now it's round. I mean, okay, certainly, but it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, perfectly round. It can be different levels that are acceptable. Okay. And then also another attribute is uh, the the texture. Typically, they're firm on the outside. The skin is firm, right? Not so much on the inside. Uh, tastes. Are, are an attribute. They can be sweet, they can be sour, um, relatively lightweight. Um, you know, you're not gonna, it'd be weird to grab an apple and it would weigh 200 pounds, right? I mean, especially if it's a small apple, like, you have no idea to pick it up, right? That would not be normal, right? Uh, so, so that's the point, that's the idea about concepts. So again, concepts have attributes. Okay, so anytime we have a concept, we have attributes. Some attributes are essential, some attributes are non-essential. For example, size. Size, I wouldn't say exactly is essential because you can have small apples and large apples and it's still an apple. Now you might say it is essential and then it fits amongst a range to where you would never really want an apple that's very small and you wouldn't want one that's very large, so it's kind of up to interpretation. In terms of metacognition, there were really four thinking strategies that Bruner discussed. And the four thinking strategies that he defined were simultaneous scanning and successive scanning, then also conservative focusing and focused gambling. Does he play poker? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. Um, the, the scanning ones are related and the focusing ones are related. So in terms of scanning strategies, uh, a learner is scanning anytime they're forming some sort of a hypothesis and then they're cross-referencing that hypothesis with different attributes to try to determine is this still true, is this now false, because I saw a case that's going to be a counterexample. Okay, so now the only difference between them is a simultaneous scanner or a person that's simultaneously scanning at a specific topic might have multiple hypotheses and be thinking, well, it could be this or this or this or this, and then be eliminating those possibilities as we go. Earlier, I think in the first example, David had kind of said some things that indicated to me he was simultaneously scanning. Um, successive scanning is um, successive scanning is going to be where you're just holding one idea and then you're scanning it with different options as you go. If it's eliminated, then you have to formulate a new a new topic. That's more genes. Well, and that's that's really uh, I mean, kind of everyone will do all of these. It sort of depends on the context, um, and it's also just sort of, sort of what's natural at the time. Uh, also, in terms of focusing, uh, a focus, uh, when, you're, when you're doing any kind of a focus, that means a learner is focusing on the attributes specifically. So they're considering these attributes, and then they're saying, okay, well, these attributes are similar. Uh, does it have to have all of these attributes? What's maybe the range of values of the attributes? So a conservative uh, person, a person that's uh, exhibiting conservative focusing is considering only one at a time. Whereas uh, focused gambling is multiple attributes at once, and they're sort of jumping. Uh, and they really only would be looking at the positive cases, so they would be trying to focus on the yeses, and then seeing how are they related, and then trying to say, okay, well, they, they all have this and this and this. So that's the idea behind that. So is this always say like a yes or no? Like the process is always yes or no? That's right. That's right. Some sort of an affirmative. So you have to have exemplars and non-exemplars, and that's the idea. And so here are the references. Let me just conclude with this. 
Um, so for myself, when I read about this, I, I really liked that it was inductive. I thought it was a very interesting strategy. I was really, really interested. And originally I had thought I would really love to come in here and do some sort of an example about something that I typically teach because it's not very often that I teach 1351. In fact, I've never taught 1351, which is the only class that I could teach where this would be salient. And uh, I thought about, well, how could I talk about like derivatives? Well, the problem is, is some of those concepts are very relational. They're very relational concepts. And so I'm still sort of trying to come up with some ideas about how that would be useful for this strategy. And what, the only kind of example that I'm thinking of is I would have to show maybe both of the different, say, functions, because it's usually a relationship between two, two functions. So I would have to show, okay, this is, here's a function, and then here's its derivative. So that's the relationship, this, so this is a yes. So you're giving two things, but that, that together represents one yes. So I'm gonna kinda have to think about that and see if I think that that could work. But in general, I think a discovery learning approach you know, is going to be effective. Awesome. Any questions? No, I'm worried about writing notes first time and doing it in my class. Okay, that's cool. I'm going to do it with molecules. I have to give it to chemistry. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm starting to like, I mean,